DHA, they're almost all DHA, but EPA is critical for mood, for focus, for circulation, and it's the first product in the market that I have that is yeah, yeah, yeah. by the balance of omega-3. Hello? Hello? Um, body. Hey, Michael. Yo. How you doing? Pretty good. Cool. You know what I got to <laughs> ask you, Jason? How do you get What's a southern that? drawl in northern Oregon? I do? You got a southern drawl. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. Maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit Canuck. Maybe it's a little like Canadian meets Alaskan meets. Maybe that is just a, maybe that is a northern accent. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. I know I go back east back there where you guys are, got and I'm like, what'd you guys say? <laughs> so the way upstate Maine and stuff. <laughs> what, do funny. we have an accent to you? Because I feel like we sound like the rest of the people, like on the news. No. You don't you don't. You and Michael okay. don't, Portia don't, you guys don't. But uh the upstate people. Uh, way way up there in Maine and all that stuff oh my gosh they they some of them not not the new generation but the older people that I was talking to it's like wow they really had the accent <laughs> yeah I always yeah, northern look. New England definitely have an accent for sure yeah yeah they do but I noticed the younger people don't because they get moved around more and stuff and but the older people that's where they were and they they didn't see it and it's different. <laughs> well, I see you're back in your library there. I yeah, like it. I am. <laughs> so you run a tractor all weekend, huh? Yeah, you like that? I just learned to do that. That's cool. I, I, put, know. Some, I put some firewood in mine the other day, or I actually had the boys load it and then I took it and dumped it. <laughs> oh good. The boys were around. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, now well, I want to now I want to like crush things. I want to knock over trees and dig holes and like level things and whatnot. It's not it's, it's kind of dangerous. It's fun. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I, it. I had to take a break from mine for a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna put, mute this. Okay. Hi, Whitney. Hi, Christine. Hi. How is everyone? Doing good, good. Doing good. good. Cold. It's cold. It's cold Not there. Ready. Not ready. Yeah. It's not too cold. I mean, we're complaining. It's like my car says it's 53 degrees right now. I think it's a little colder than that, but yeah. The nights are getting a little chilly. Definitely colder than it is here. <laughs> Our grandpa, our mom's father, was like the most kind, timid, soft-spoken, loving man. And the only uh -huh. time, and he, care, dog, get it. The only <laughs> time he ever showed his temper was when there was a draft. If there was a cold draft, that oh. came, he was the scariest person I ever saw. But that was the only time he ever got mad about anything. Oh my goodness! He didn't like to be cold. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame him, to be honest. I'm not a big fan of being cold either. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I decided to pop over and say hi today <laughs> for a little I bit. Your face. I didn't even recognize you. I only <laughs> popped your head. I was like, who is that? <laughs> wait, does it, is it better if it's like this? Wait, hold on. Oh, no, wait. Now that's just covered. So is this better? Can you see me? Hi, you're horizontal. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Huh? Okay, we're going back to this. 
Hi. <laughs> What'd you say? What's up, Michael? Pinky. Yo. Yo. What up? <clears throat> What's going down? Christine's up in this. How you been? I'm up in here. Good, good. Just you living. Wonderful. You glowing? What's going on with your life? <laughs> I, I'm just glowing because of the lighting from the window and the fact that I'm sitting in front of computers. Oh, is that right? I'm good. You can, just yeah. the, you can just take the compliment. You don't have to explain. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's what we're here good. for. Yeah, settling into life, like trying to be home more and like be back in kind of routine <laughs> for a little season. We'll see how that works for me. <laughs> but Good. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. But it's been. I, I kind of. I was sick after I came back from my last trip, and it's kind of still lingered a little bit. But I was wanting to hop on and spend time with people and I was just like nope I'm going to bed it's 7 p.m I need to sleep it's 6 p.m I need to sleep <laughs> so kind of glad to be feeling a little bit better I think that's under control now but no we're good how's good. everybody else are you guys good. yeah good everybody yeah well, I, I think everybody's good anybody want to say something that I don't know about okay <laughs> yeah it's right you're good keep it down yeah <laughs> <laughs> um well good because we got a good topic to talk about uh i i posted it as a moral responsibility but truly hold on let me just turn that down here the whole the whole topic is really um our happiness our personal happiness is our moral responsibility and i say that meaning it's a moral responsibility because of how you are affects the people around you greatly. And I don't think we take enough credit or understand that enough about the mood that we're in and the more responsibility we have to make ourselves healthy and happy because of who you're affecting in your life. Just because there's so many people we come in interaction with and, and not consciously or, or on purpose that we rub off or uh, put our energy on them and we're in a bad space or mood or not feeling good physically or mentally. It is affecting other people. That's how, that's how that works. It's the same way you feel really good when you're around good people and you're having a great time. Everybody gets that little dopamine in them and that feels great. Uh, the same thing's happening when you're not feeling great. If you're not feeling good or having a, an off day or you're, you're mentally being challenged or you're physically, you're not feeling the best about yourself. It doesn't matter how good you are at, at hiding it or not burdening other people with it. <clears throat> That's not how it works. People can feel off you and you do affect the people around you. So, uh, you yeah, know, I call it, call it having a moral responsibility to everybody else and have that as a little bit of motivation too, not just yourself. Cause we always talk about how hard it is to, we can talk about these things and we talk about what is the right thing. And, and we know if we use, you talk things in existence or you speak better with uh, better vocabulary or things you eat or exercise, we've, we've hammered this stuff for, you know, the past year and a half, but as we can all admit, it's not always easy to manage a lifestyle that we talk about. Um, you know, Christine just brought up a good point. Like trying to get back into the routine of things, sometimes we get in this, this area of like, we're traveling a lot, we're doing things, which can be fun and we're having a good time, but it's also taking us out of our element. Um, I'm moving around a lot right now and I'm traveling a lot and it's hard for me to do certain things that I would normally do if I was in one spot. All right, now I could make it happen. I can prioritize and just say, no matter what, if I'm on the road, I'm still going to do X, Y, Z. But the truth of the matter is it just gets away from you a little bit. Sometimes when you're not in your space and the things are all right in front of you, or your home is set up a certain way where you wake up in the morning and you take these pills and you're shaking, and you have your, all the things you have, and then you're on the, find yourself on the road for two weeks in a hotel or in somebody else's space. It's not as easy to do those things. I actually find it harder when you're in somebody else's space than traveling in a hotel. 
because I feel like when you're in somebody else's space, you don't want to be doing, there's like this thing with me, especially it's like, well, if they don't have the certain things I ha- want or need or like a blender or anything, it's like, oh, just, I won't just, I just won't do that today. Whereas if I'm in the hotels, I can at least bring a lot of stuff with me and I just unload it in the hotel room and I have it. Um, but it's a more responsibility. It's us making the effort to make sure that we're constantly checking on what our attitude is. And um, I think when it comes to this topic, I'm going to talk more about the brain versus the mind. So like there's some separation, the conversation about that, but truthfully to have a mindset, you have to have a healthy brain, the actual organ here. So your mindset's your thoughts and your ideas and, and, and how you present yourself or a position you put yourself in, in your head, but the brain is what controls the mind. You have to have a healthy brain to allow yourself to have the thoughts and ideas and their creativities and all those things. And healthy brain has more to do with how you take care of it physically, what we, what we feed it, all these things. So I think, I think for me, why it came up heavy was one, I was listening to some, uh, um, a psychologist, Dr. Amen on some topics. One, two, I was thinking, you know, I'm traveling a ton. Like, how can I get a consistency going and still do what I'm doing? Um, and then three, how do I like keep it important, right? And when I hear like moral responsibility, it's like, okay, that's important. That's like spiritual responsibility. That's like the stuff we talk about on our off weeks of the responsibility, your relationship with God. I mean, I think when there's a, a, a bigger term to something, it holds some weight to it. Whereas if I'm like, you know, I'm going to start working out next week. It's like, well, if I don't really believe it, or if I don't really want to do it, or I haven't been doing it, I'm like, I could easily get talked out of it. And usually the person that can talk you out of it is yourself. Right? Because you can say, oh, well, this came up. I have to, I, okay, I'll start tomorrow. Or, or, or my, my week got busy. So I think when we add something to, we have to add something behind a change. Now, it's not always like, oh, just change for the better good. You have to do these things. Uh, like working out. I don't think it's like everybody has to like do this, eat this, work out. Everything is, is different for everybody. What I'm saying here, the more responsibility is more about how we treat ourselves, right, in our brain. So what makes us the happiest the most often? That's relative, but the brain itself is not. There is science behind what the brain needs to be fed to win, right? There's science behind the fact that we need certain minerals in our body that fight things like depression, that fight off things that we don't naturally make in our bodies. There's some stuff that we need in our bodies that we actually can't get from anywhere else that we don't produce in our bodies. So um, like DHA or uh, EPA or fatty acids, like there's stuff that we have to take, we have to get elsewhere that can help us. And that stuff like that helps fight off depression, moods, stuff like that in your brain because it's healthy for your brain. So there are things that we can do uh, besides the post-active which we call, I think, usually it's like, oh, I'm depressed or I feel low now. I'm all the way to this point. Now, what do I do? Well, do I want to feel good right now or do I want to feel good forever and later? And most of the time is I want to feel good now. And that's where medication comes in. Medications, usually I need to feel good now. I have a headache, take a towel. I want to feel good now. I'm going through anxiety or depression, take Prozac. I don't know what they're called the pill. And so I can get off it now. <clears throat> but where are we in the stance of like getting ahead of that and doing the things that prevent it from ever occurring? So you don't feel helpless in the moment. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. So I, I, I dove deep into some of his stuff and I was listening to some of his podcasts and it, it went anywhere from how, what we say in the morning, what we've always talked about, music we listen to. He did a study on um, music in the subconscious. I think uh, heavy metal was the worst by far. 
Heavy metal was the worst. I think then it was rap. Classical was the best for your mind. Right behind it, in a close tie, was country, which is that was a crazy one to me because I always thought growing up, country was like sad stories. Like they were <laughs> always talking about sad stories. Um, but he did a study on this stuff. And, and truthfully, sometimes we don't think that music affects us that much, or maybe it affects us in a way we don't think. But to understand the subconscious is always listening. And it's always being affected. So sometimes we might like heavy metal or, or rap to get going, but it's it has a negative effect on your brain itself. And that's that's science. That's not like, I don't like heavy metal. It's just the way it is. Our brain reacts to a lot of things. Um, yeah, I think, I think really paying attention to what matters for the brain health so that we can have a good mindset because we talk about mindset a lot right we talk about keeping a good mindset speaking well trying to keep in a good position but there's some things we can do and feed the brain itself that organ we can feed that so that it already shows up for us right so we don't have to think through it a lot of times we we just we have to try to think through a good mindset like how can i be in a better mood Right. Like I, I need to I need to say better things about myself. I need to talk through this. I need to I need to hear better things from people around me. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do this. And we can make a list of things to try to get us out of this rut and be like, I want to be happy. But truthfully, there's also a lot of things you can just be feeding your brain that prevents those things from coming up. So <clears throat> there's some interesting things he talked about, like uh it was kind of funny. He, he thinks, you know, in moderation, he says the number one like falsity he thinks in psychology and everything is, is people that talk about doing things in moderation. He thinks it's the biggest bullshit line in history because it's just an excuse for us to do the cheat days, like our cheat days, like that's my cheat day. So it's giving you an excuse to put the poison or the toxic in your body or, or make the bad decision okay. It's an interesting theory he had on that. He talks a lot about that, which was I thought was pretty interesting because it's it is we have we have a lot of these like cliche lines and things that allows us to do the things we want to be doing, the bad things, because we be like, well, if I just drink in moderation, well, okay, so you want to drink less is what you're saying. That's okay, but also just alcohol is the most toxic thing for your body, period. <laughs> so it's not. He does, he jokes about like in moderation, right? Like, well, if I do everything in moderation, I'm, I'm balanced human being and, 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 and treating my body and brain well. Um, <clears throat> talks about love, love food that loves you back. I love that one. Like love food that loves you back. Like there's a lot of food that we can be eating like it's, that doesn't spike those levels in our, in our body. Sugars, we obviously also know is one of the worst things. We've talked about this before, like sugar being really bad for the body, but it could be really toxic um, when it's stripped from the fiber. So like when it's out of the actual origin, it becomes toxic. So orange juice is not good for you. It's highly toxic for you because as a ton of sugar, it's been stripped from the fiber source versus eating an orange. So it's just interesting how we've we've created um, what I think is probably like skipping a bunch of steps and the ease of life that you're making everything easy. Like, well, instead of like peeling an orange and eating it, I can just get a juice from the gas station. It's orange juice, right? But when it's stripped from the fiber itself, it doesn't have the balance to help break down the sugar. So the sugar ends up becoming toxic, it's sugar water. So, um, just little stuff that we, we, I think we take for granted because we can tell ourselves that I've had my orange juice. Orange juice has been boasted to be pretty healthy. In my, my whole life, at least, like you talk about it's in schools or, or things like this, but actually it's not it's very good at all. And it's actually hurting our brain um, in those ways. So it was interesting to, to hear some of the things because how many, how many times you hear juicing? You know, like people juice cleanses and they only go on juice or juicing or, or I, I, that's all I'm drinking right now. It's like, okay, 
but why not just have an orange or the apple or the kale itself? I don't even know you can squeeze anything out of a kale. I thought it was the driest thing on the planet Earth when I ate it. I was like, how do you squeeze juice out of that thing? Apparently you can. <clears throat> um, oh, here, here's cool. I wrote some stuff down he, he has from Good Habits. I thought it was really cool. So um, his, his number one best habit was to ask all the time yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? So a very small habit you can do every day when you're about to do something. You know, it's not, this is not the food police. It's not like you can't have stuff. I don't care what you eat. I'm just an information finder. I'm the same way. I love food. Like, I love it. I adore it. It's like everything to me. It's literally. So I'm not always checking, but it's an interesting thought to have. Like, everywhere you go or everything you do, but you cook is, is this good for me or is this bad for me? My brain, you know? So it's a good little habit to, to check in. Um, another thing I thought was pretty cool was, um, you know, we talked about before, like getting up in the morning and the first thing we do, the first five minutes affects your day the most, what you do in those first five minutes. He had an interesting talking about before bed, um, asking yourself what, what, what went well. You know, again, we'll be checking in at the end of the day. What went well today? Like what, what happened that was good today? Even on a bad day. Because all this stuff is changing the way our brain thinks. And it's actually um, the dopamine in our minds. So he talks about dripping dopamine and not dumping it, which is a very interesting take on it. So dripping dopamine instead of dumping it, because dumping dopamine ends up depleting your pleasure centers. And then what happens is you become addicted to that high level of dopamine dump and you search for more and more and more. This is how addiction happens. This is, and not just in, in drugs, this is anything. Uh, he used a good example, which I thought was good as he talked about a video he had posted and it got like 14 million views or something like crazy. And then he got the, the next video he had posted a couple months later got like 8,000 views and, it, and there was nothing. He felt, he felt let down or a little bit of a failure, right? Because he, he dumped so hard in the first one. He dumped don't be on the idea of 14 million. Like he, like he got that many hits. Um, so it's not just, it's not like a drug thing, but it, it's an addiction thing. It's, it's uh, recognition, success, anything. But he talks about dripping dopamine in, in the sense of, these micro moments. So paying attention more to micro moments. He, he, he describes his moments with his daughter, like when he holds his daughter's hand and he walks, like not just the experience of having the time with his daughter, but what's her hand feel like, her skin, like these micro moments of, of feeling happy. So dripping dopamine instead of dumping it. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, I think that's something I definitely have never thought about in a way like how, how often have we you've been in something we really enjoy, been with somebody we really enjoy or maybe food or an experience we like to do or the gym and really get deep into the, the micro moments of how, why it makes you happy. I think that one's a really cool one. I think that's a creative way of making sure you keep perspective, right? One, we always talk about that, but also like why you enjoy these things. Right, so that you don't get over it. I think we do a lot. We we dump a little bit. This is an exercise one to me. Like it's easy to dump dopamine when you, you start getting to work out again. You feel good and you get over that little hump and you work out. And then there's some there's some point along the way. And this is why the gym's got this down to a science. Is like you start to fade because unless you're one of those gym nuts that you cannot live a day without being there, because there are people like that it always fades a little bit. It's not, it's not always as fun where we get to a point where our bodies, we, we accept the way we look and then we're like, okay, well, I'm here. And then you start to fall off a little bit. How do we make sure we don't dump too much dopamine too early so that we respect and give the credits due to the things that we love the most or that we're trying to keep consistent in our life. Even. We don't even have to love it, but maybe we want to keep something as a 
habit consists consistently in our life and not let it fall off every winter right when we hibernate um so yeah dripping dopamine i thought that was a great one <clears throat> and then uh oh this was a good one positive thinking versus accurate thinking right this is a good one this was really good I think we've touched a little bit on this stuff, but like the way he said it, positive thinking versus accurate thinking. Like positive thinking is like you could positively think about anything, even dangerous stuff. I mean, you can be like, I'm gonna I I, I can drive home at 100 miles an hour in the rain. No problem. I could positively think about anything, even if it's detrimental or bad for me. Right, you could talk to yourself. This is words and positively thinking about something that has a negative um, outcome or impact. But accurately think is just telling yourself the truth. Right, so asking yourself, what is the truth? I think that's a really good habit. Like, I think probably a couple of years ago, I learned in a relationship that I felt a certain way. <clears throat> Like, why doesn't this person like you? Why aren't they paying attention? Why are they like going down the that path instead of asking the truth about what is the truth? Do they actually not like me? Like ask the question instead of assume the answer. So what is the actual truth? It's a great, it's a great way to think about it. Changed it changed everything for me because I still do it, but I catch myself quickly instead of letting myself go down that rabbit hole. So the assumption of what's happening with somebody else. We talked about this, like we talked about texting or lost communication, but always, always checking in and asking yourself, what is, what is the truth about what I'm saying? It's a huge help for your mind. It'll, it'll, it'll take you, it'll save you hours of days, save you hours of your lifetime to <clears throat> when you get, get to that point of why won't they pension? Why does he like me? Why this? Well, hold on. What is the actual truth here? What am I actually asking? So I, I love that. And it's changed my life tremendously because I, I, I was able to create a spiral situation because it would turn into why aren't they? Why aren't they? Why don't they? And then it would, it would flip into easily after time to think about it is because I'm not enough, right? can flip right into that and take you down a, a really shitty path. So the truth, I think accurate thinking is more truthful. It's the facts. It's what's actually going on. So I loved, I love that comparison of those two. Um, a couple things for dopamine, like, which is good, like pumpkin seeds. Um, we talked about stuff for, to help you naturally for, um, help with depression, anything like that. And this is not, if you have it, it's like preventative. I'm not saying if you have depression, take this, I'm saying preventative, keeping your brain healthy. So it doesn't, your brain doesn't go down those paths. This is not, by the time it gets to your mind and you start thinking you're depressed, your brain's already been there. By the time it gets to you and your eye and your out and your verbal output, it's already there. So I'm not saying post, I'm saying as a habit. You know, omega threes, fatty acids, uh, uh, DHA, EPA. These are all all very good. That help that we don't we can't produce ourselves, but help tremendously for the brain. Um, I think it's uh, theanine. It's in green tea. You can get this in a mineral just outside of green tea, but drinking green tea is good. But you can get it as a separate, just a supplement. Huge benefits uh, for the mind. So <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Like if you want to, if you ever want to listen to him, there's a lot of studies he's done. He did like a, he did a, a, he didn't do it. A school did this study. They took this group of kids and then they followed them for 90 years of study. I mean, it was nuts. It was an ongoing thing. Lifetime of these, this, this uh, things. And they, they were, they were checking to see on the attitudes of people, how they grew up and, uh, were they worried? Were they anxious? Were they uh, free-flowing? 
and and crazy enough i thought this was a crazy study it was the people that had the don't worry be happy mentality like kind of just chill like don't worry about anything at all we we all know that like like nothing i'm talking about like don't worry be happy whatever happens happens dude they died the earliest out of all the all the people from accidents and curable non-action because they were like don't worry be happy like they could have went in and got their tooth fixed from the dentist because it was sore and turned into gangus and it infected their face and they that like things like that think about you know I thought it was interesting, not because of really their attitude, as you think about don't worry, be happy. It sounds like a nice attitude. It sounds like peaceful, actually, when I say it. It's like, oh, don't worry, be happy. It's like, just chill. But what he was trying to say with that study and what he's trying to say is there's a good balance between anxious and busy mind and don't worry, be happy that you live a very long time in a healthy brain because your brain needs to function. On levels, he's at problem solving. He needs to have some worry to it. It needs to, it needs that mechanism. It's built like that, so you can get to the point of either side where nothing matters can be detrimental to the brain as well. So it's another just super interesting thing. And I, I, I thought a crazy one was anybody that has kids, and us because we've been through because we were kids. He's done over like 250,000 brain scans. And the number one thing he's found that's detrimental to adulthood after being a child is <clears throat> mild traumatic brain injuries. So anything, just like football, the kids playing football or baseball or um, soccer, anything, banging each other around, hockey. We play hockey all the time. We're just hitting each other as hard as we can. Um, <clears throat> uh, little small accidents. Uh, that abuse, obviously, you know, child abuse. I mean, it was a bigger, I think it was a bigger thing. We joke about it now, like all these kids are soft today. You know, our, our dad used to beat us in the, in the front yard. So everybody saw it driving by. We laugh about it, but it truly like, <laughs> it could cause brain injury for the lifetime of an adult. Mild traumatic brain injuries, which are pretty much pretty close to undiagnosed concussions a lot of people a lot of people have concussions and don't know it it's a massive thing especially youngsters they're playing banging around hitting each other they don't have to be in la la land for you to know that they're concussed sometimes you don't know they're concussed because that's what's called a mild traumatic brain injury but it has a long-term huge effect on uh, the brain over the time of the growth as a child into an adulthood to the point where they've linked it to a ton of stuff and cause of suicide, homelessness, uh, space thinking, like all this stuff. It's crazy. There's 3 million new concussions every year recorded. Those are the ones that like you can tell somebody's been concussed because they're, they're not in the, the world in front of you. Right. They think it's, they think it's triple that the amount that's happening that are, aren't reported a lot but we celebrate contact sports for our for our kids you know i mean all, all the sports i played was growing up so all contact sports besides golf all of them wrestling giving each other in headlocks banging each other on the mat like football hockey everything we did that's why i messed up Can you see that's why I'm doing these things. I'm all jacked up, I'm trying to figure out 41, trying to figure out my life. So it took too many hits to the brain. But you're not um, jacked up, Pinky. I have to yeah. correct you. <laughs> yeah. So, but to, I guess to our point, there's a lot of information today and usually I don't do it like this, but I wanted to, I wanted to bring up more of the facts because I think it's, it's relevant to just, we talk about, good faith stuff that we talk about all the time, like what's better for us. And there's a lot of that stuff we talk about. It's, it's very important. The way we talk, the way we surround ourselves with people, the circles we hang out with, the things we believe in our own mind that are told to us. Um, all these are great, but there are stuff out there that are facts too, that we have to listen to that can help us get away from those struggle 
those struggle times like like why am i foggy why am i freezing stuff why am i feeling like crap i don't I didn't do anything i wasn't out drinking i felt like i got good sleep why am i feeling like this and a lot of times it's truthfully because of <clears throat> what we're putting in like the brain needs to feed why is my hair white at 48 yeah why is it white <laughs> dude I was just thinking that I was about to, I was like, why is your hair white? Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> I just had to say oh, that. I think because I think you're like, you remind me of tool man, Tim Taylor. You're ready for the next Santa Claus. <laughs> He's interviewing this winter. He's <laughs> not going to our Christmas stuff with Santa Claus. He's an outfit. But uh, interesting quote time to to understand the soul of a society it's not how they treat their outstanding citizens but how they treat their criminals like why are we why are we it's a bigger topic i don't want to go down this rabbit hole but it, that means to me why are we treating our sick like shit why are we not caring about rehabilitation why are we not caring about our sick why aren't we, and I'm saying sick as in like from depressed to suicidal thoughts to criminals, like truly what brought them there? Why aren't we interested to help that situation and look at the actual facts of what's happening instead of just saying, well, oh, those are bad people. Separate them from me. I would never do that. And truthfully, that's a bunch of bullshit because you don't know what you're capable of doing. And when or for what reason and what he's trying to say what he was trying to say about what i'm trying to say is why not just feed ourselves good so that we have the constant we have a better opportunity at all times to make better decisions be more creative feel good treat people well have an aura around us affect people in a positive way i mean it sounds all great right like why are why are we so abusive to ourselves and then more abusive to the people we think that we're better than? Why are we separated? I've always believed Amber knows this. I've, I've said it a, a lot and I've stopped saying it because I truly don't believe it anymore. But I used to say it all the time that I thought I was, I've always felt that I've been one small decision away from being the worst human being on the planet. I used to think that for like years. Or the greatest. You've also thought that. Yeah, yeah, true. And I did say that. Thank you for correcting me. I, I used to say, because I had this like big thing in my brain, I had this big idea of what I was supposed to be doing here on this earth. I've had it for a long time. I've always felt it, like it overcomes me. But then I've always thought maybe that feeling is my, the death of me, my detriment. Maybe it's, it's my past. Maybe it's my dad. Maybe it's his parents. Maybe it's I could just be the worst, right? And I thought to myself, it's like, what is that about us, right? So I think a lot has to do with both. We always talk about one, just dropping the ego, self-love. We talk about how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to others, how we present ourselves, what we do for others, what we do for ourselves. And then we got to apply the other stuff too. We got to apply the science part too. We got to apply what we're feeding our brain that controls everything we do. By the time it gets to your mind and it's in your head as an idea and you verbally spit it out, your brain has already been affected. And can, can I say something? No. Okay. No. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, just to your point, um, you know, part of that, and it's not an excuse at all, but the reason that it's so hard for us is that most of us who we interact with, you know, this particular audience and whatnot, here I'll get it, is um, our middle class to lower class upbringings. And so it, the nutritional factor, the quantified science factor start, started very early on, get in there. Um, and so, you know, when we look at impoverished communities and impoverished students, you know, they don't have a chance to do as well on testing because they don't have anything that's feeding their brain or their heart or whatnot, um, you know, when they get cool and things. So these are things that, you know, this again, just like our mindset, 
is something that first had to be a deconstruction. We had to first become aware of it to then educate ourselves, which takes an entire lifetime to learn things that in reverse, by the way, of what we were taught, because even our food charts and everything that was on a cereal box, everything we were given as young children was based in sugar, grain, dairy, cheese, like things that were actually capitalist, um, profitable cash crops for whatever nation or country we grew up in. And so for us, you know, it was things that really weren't (laughs) all that advantageous to us unless we really grew up, you know, in an agricultural farm or something like that. So again, this lifetime. And so we don't need to even get into the beating ourselves up, but part of the brain health um, is just, you know, being just as important as the mindset is, We weren't really taught these things and we also didn't have the tools or the right nutrition until we became adults and we can make our own money and start to make choices about the food we eat and and saying those things to ourselves. Hey, is this good for my brain? Instead of just slamming a gallon of milk because it was the only thing in the house, um, you know, Mm -hmm. when we were growing up. So it's interesting because access is a a big part of that. And then of course, education and, and practice as always. No, I'm glad you brought it up because that was one of his, Dr. Amon's points was that he was talking about school and what's in school now, access to having Pop-Tart. Pop-Tart's over a study, the worst thing you could possibly put in your body, a Pop-Tart, proven. It's, and it's one of the options at school, most schools. So it's funny, the guy who was interviewing him said, well, why, I don't understand why with all the knowledge we know today, all the things we know today, all the talk, these kind of talks and the, the education that's widely available now, why aren't we doing something to ban certain foods that are out there that are, that are physically causing damage to our future? And it was so, he so calmly, he so calmly answered. That's how you keep poor people poor. Exactly. But he goes, but. I believe in my heart, we can do something about it. The, aw- the aw- awoken people, the aware people, and the people that matter, we can still do something about it. And he goes, I wholeheartedly believe it. But he so commonly said the truth. It keeps people where they want them. So in-, in public schools where we grew up, because that's what they put in there. It's, it's, it's part of the budget of the area. Of the right, people. mashed potatoes. Crust. Yeah, so it's is so a lot of the, the Ayurvedic schools and a lot of the like small progressive sects of the new age parent um, that want to put their kids in like Indian lore type based schools and things. They are already putting like gardening is part of the curriculum, just as important as any other thing. Yep. These kids learn how to tend and curate a garden as part of their daily obligations for the day so that that's something they can take into life I mean imagine had we had that growing up I mean some of you know if you had a great grandpa or something but in schools how amazing would that be to learn how to grow organic food and then can it and sustain it so you can eat it all year round too I mean these are things that if you didn't grow up in a tribe or um, in a family you know out in the middle of nowhere you just did not get that skill set and but it can be done and it is being done but in very small sets some of we, but we have to we have to grab so that's that's the point it's happening but it's happening in small little chunks it's happening where people are like well let's not do the collective let's do our area and i get that but the goal is to touch the collective right? it's to touch the masses it's to it's to get to enough of people not to small areas of either the wealthy which is a lot of times the case or the enlightened, which is also a lot of times the case. It's a closed community, society-ish, where they're they're doing the things and they all believe in it and great. But the collective is the problem, right? So how do we combat it? I want its education, I think, amongst us and our people. So if you have kids, you got to just make them aware more often. Uh, I was talking to Whitney one time about, <clears throat> like, The hours, I always think about, I don't have kids, but like I think about the hours that some other human is teaching your kids a day versus the hours you have with them is insane of a thought to me. It's like somebody, that town or that society or that school or whatever has 
more control over your kids thinking truthfully from the food that goes in their bodies at the school to what they're telling them than you do from our standpoint, not from an importance. Tons of parents are really good about, you know, getting their kids the right information, the right food, all this stuff. I'm just saying as a collective, it's crazy. Like you, you put your kid, how many, how many hours do we go to school? Six, seven hours of the day or something. Plus probably something after school, obviously after school program. So it's a lot of hours that you're with other people's thoughts and things. Um, Whitney worked the, didn't she just work the stand Whitney at a baseball game or something? What are they selling there? Yeah, not good stuff. Like what? But name something. Candy. So you have all sorts of candy, soda, Gatorade. Mm. We had the conversation about Gatorade. Um, pretzels, pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. I mean, it's so not, so it's that's not nutritious. Mean, yeah, it's a dopamine absolute dopamine dump you're talking about carbohydrates and sugars both dumps i will say though the schools have been trying to be better about lunches so a lot not a lot some of this of the stuff that they feed the kids for lunch or that's available to the students now for lunch is locally sourced food and it will always tell you what's locally sourced or what came from what farm which is good because at least they're being mindful of it. And That's they good. have lots of different options now. If you look at a school menu for kids, and my kids are in public school, they're both in elementary school, um, but it's not just tater tots and chicken nuggets anymore. So there's an option. There's, of course, and there's always been an option for a hot lunch or a cold lunch, but now they have like a vegetarian lunch, and which is they try to use all local farmed vegetables, which, which is good. So it's taking a step in the right direction. I don't know if that's across the nation that they're doing that. That's being done in New York. Do the kids still right get now? to decide when they're at school though, which, what they eat? Like they can choose um, the dad still? They could, I mean, will you send them to school knowing that you have to know, obviously, if you're going to send your kid to school with a lunch or if they're going to buy right, lunch, right, but right. they know like you have the menu beforehand and they know, so they get to choose if they want, you know, a hot lunch or a cold lunch, but then you help knowing your kids, you know, that are going to choose, you know, they plan it before, but. No, I like that. I mean, I didn't know that about the school. So I'm glad you, you said that. I'm glad that they're doing something. Doing something. Yeah. I mean, it's not you know, th- going to be the most nutritious, but at least it's taking a step in the right direction. How do you get the crap out though? Just like, just take it out. Why is it a choice amongst kids that shouldn't be making choices about things they don't know? That's what I'm kind of saying. Like, right. Yeah. I love that they're changing, but I think they're changing because they're getting pressured. Like everything. Oh, yeah. I don't want to get in trouble. I'm the administrator. I want to put my hands up because two, two parents lost their minds. So just add vegetarian to the menu. But is there education at school telling the kids? It shouldn't just be up to the parents to be like, listen, kids, you got to eat. It should be the system. It should be the community. It should be us together. Uh, as a parent, you should trust that the, the teacher that's taking care of your kid all day has the same alignment as you. That well, and that's thing? another <laughs> scary part because you do, you send your kids to school and then especially through the pandemic where parents weren't even allowed in the schools. So you send your kids blindly <laughs> to these other adults that you don't get to meet until like my first, well, we met them at open house, but this is the first open house that we've had in three years. And then parent teacher conference, you meet them, but not until, you know, not until they're already in class with your children that you get to meet them or you know who they are or so. Yeah. I I guess, I guess, look, it's all, it's all relative. I guess like back in the day, um, it was probably it was probably a more of the same, truthfully, because I don't know if you thought any different, Amber. I don't think the only time Dad ever came to school ever, I don't think he knew a name of a teacher, didn't know anybody on school, was to pick me up to take me out of school to go golfing because he was a scam artist. Like I, I, my mom didn't really know any much teachers, but they didn't really do that either. I guess I mean, 
I but guess it was I, a different it was a different culture no where, i know um, that but teachers were things. like actually respected in the way of you didn't question them and we didn't yeah. even think about what they did behind closed doors or if they were alcoholics or if they liked broccoli true. or chocolate true yeah but it was still going on i guess is what i'm saying like the difference of generation is still the same thing the food was shit there was no education about it home ec got cut from schools home ec was like hi like teach you how to actually be an adult it's the only class in school that like kind of was teaching you hey to cook to knit like the things that you would maybe do not really tomorrow. they taught you how to make monkey bread and i mean come on that's no. well i don't know where you went to school <laughs> We went to Johnson City, went to city school. I don't know where you went. I went to Binghamton. I went to Binghamton. Oh, Binghamton. It's the worst Hampton. Um, no, but not to get off topic. So anyway, I guess the point is we got to stay morally responsible for our brains. We got to keep an eye on the people that are around us, older or younger, because truthfully, there are things out there, I'm telling you. There are things out there that are natural Prozac, for example, that have the effects. There's studies out. It's not gimmick. It's not BS. It's not, oh, it's like it. We have to take it for a while. No, it is. Anything, look at it this way. Anything there's a pill for today, there's a natural remedy for it. And you know why there's a pill for it? Because they got the idea from the natural remedy. We're not smarter than any, anybody before us. It are, existed, they wanted to streamline the process and turn it into a business. Everything's existed. Where do you think extract to some form of medicines come from? Natural remedies, they'll put a little bit in a pill. And I'm not saying everything's bad. I'm not saying that medicine should go away. I'm just saying there's a, we need to go this way back a little bit, try all the things first, breathing, um, natural remedies, the way we feed our brain, how we think, talk, all those things. And if everything's failing, then yeah, modern medicine is not bad. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there's so many things that we skip. We like to skip the whole line to get to the, I want to feel good now. Instead, I, I'll wait for it and feel good forever. It's okay to suffer. When you have a when you have pain and you take a painkiller, it doesn't cure the pain. It blocks the signal to your brain that says you're in pain. So can you see how that could be detrimental to you if you like had pain and you couldn't do like you were in the football game, you took a painkiller, you didn't feel it, so you went back in the game and you actually ruined your leg or your ACL? your quad, you ripped, you tear. That's what's happening every day. You see injuries. We saw injuries coming in Exos every day from these athletes because they were masking pain to play. They didn't want to lose contracts. They don't want to lose money. They had to play. They didn't want to lose their career. But all they were doing was just tearing apart that, the area that was in pain. So there's one thing to mask, right, to feel good now. But to prevent forever and feel good forever, whew, that's what I want to be. I want to be creative. I want to be clear. I want my mind to be sharp when I'm in my 90s, when I'm in my 200s, when I hit 300. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? No, nobody, just me. I'm going to live till three, at least 300. So I don't know what you guys are talking about. I'll be having these. I'll be still having these, but we'll be, we'll be in virtual, we'll be touching each other virtually. But anyway, that was my rant for this evening. Um, it's on and on and on. Don't take anything for granted. One, the brain, it's your operation. It's your, it's literally the, the main frame for everything that happens in your life. What you see, what you do, what you feel, what you touch, what you hear, what you smell, all of it comes from feeding that thing. Um, and then, you know, the whole, moderation or the excuses or the lies we tell ourselves like if it's toxic it's toxic period you know my toxic is alcohol i've been on i've, I've drank it my whole life and i have it for a while and then i do and then i don't i do and i don't only problem with me is i don't like alcohol 
I don't really love it. I'm, I'm, I don't drink at home. I don't come home after a day and like want a beer. I don't crave alcohol ever. But when I drink it, I drink. I drink it. Now, <clears throat> does that mean I do it in moderation because I don't do it seven days a week? I do it one day a week or one day every other week, but I make up for the rest. Is that okay? Because I just do it in moderation. It's still toxic, right? So anything. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. If it alters your mind uh, in a way that it changes your thought process or puts you in a better state, marijuana can do that to you. Um, alcohol can do that to you. Psychedelics can do that to you. It is toxic. Um, so I'm not saying be cl clean life, everything's got to go, everything toxic. I'm just saying, if we're doing, we're already doing toxic things in our life, why not balance it out with some good? It's not, it's not really hard to get some supplements and start taking them in the morning. Some certain ones too, not, not a multivitamin and some vitamin C. I'm not, not the common, like look into what your body's deficient of, but things that you don't make. Omega fatty acids are things we just we, we need to be putting in our body. We need to get them from somewhere else. So if you're not getting them, it'll help your brain. It'll help the cloudiness. It'll help uh, memory. It'll help uh, suppress depression. Just what it is. So I like to I like to take a, a lot of my pills all week so that I can drink on the weekends. No. <laughs> Nobody's like, nobody? Okay. All it's right. not funny. Yeah. I know. But I really, the best thing uh, of tonight, I love that. I like when you get on the science stuff because most of us don't think that way because we are kind of more the right brained uh, folks. But I really liked the, um, what did you, what was the term he used for the micro dosing of dopamine or the small? Oh, drip moment? versus dump. They drip. Micro moments. Micro moments. Yeah, I really like that. That's a neat way to really start to, you know, change the day a little bit instead of we're always looking for the big win, right? Instead yeah. of the micros. So that's good. I think it's a good relationship one. I think the two things I picked up the most from listening was that one, the drip dopamine and micro moments of your life um, tied in with the what's the truth question. I think that could be those two things to me, like immediately went to relationship. Because I think those are the most tied up with people. Like your friendships, everybody's like, oh, we'll be friends forever. We get in fights and hate each other, talk shit to each other. You might not talk to a friend for two years and then you talk to them. It's like right back to peas and carrots. But when we get intimately involved, romantically involved with somebody, uh, the level goes up a little bit. And I think that's why breakups are so hard and, and get hateful and things start to manifest in, in one another's mind about what actually happened because they're not doing that enough. They're not saying what was the truth. Right. And I think to prevent that, you know, before that, I think the drip dopamine, the, the micro moments is awesome. Like that part like made so much sense to me. Like to think, I mean, you're sitting next to somebody, you're holding your hand, like, what does your hand feel like? What does your skin feel like? What does it make you feel like it's warm, cold? Like these little micro burst moments of like happiness. Why you're happy. Do you just hold hands because that's what couples do? Or does it make you happy? I want to tell you, a friend of mine, <clears throat> I got to tell you this because when he told me, I thought it was ridiculous at the time. He was going through some struggles with his wife <clears throat> and he had, he had gone out on her. And he had started seeing somebody else. And he had told me about it for the first time. And I was asking him why, because I thought they were, you know, to me, these two people had it. Like they were just really good, both of them separately and both of them together. <clears throat> and I remember this thing I'll never forget. He said, she used to tickle scratch my arm. Like if we were driving, she tickle scratch my arm or if we were just laying on the couch to do it. And she stopped doing it. Like it wasn't like a natural thing, right? And I thought to myself, how fucking ridiculous of something to tell me when you just told me the other thing. 
you know, I thought how selfish of a moment. Now, I'm not saying he is right. What I'm saying is, in honor of what we're saying, these micro moments, to him, that was such a big deal. Does it doesn't justify anything. I'm just saying to him, that micro moment was his dopamine drip. It was just a special thing to him. And he and it, it stuck me forever. I'll never forget it. It was 10 plus years ago, but it's like that matters. That shit matters. I think we have to be micro moments for us, what makes us happy. And then also that's the question too. What do you think those micro moments are for the person next to you, around you, with you? And then you can just ask yourself what the truth is. Can you imagine if he asked, stopped and said, I wonder, I wonder why she's not doing that. Instead of he felt a certain way and just went with it. It took him another way. So those are the two that caught me the most. I'm glad you said that, Amber. I mean, those, those two were the, the big takeaways because it's something we have control of right away. Um, but yeah, if you ever guys want to look him up, it's a uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, like just like Amen, A M E N, <clears throat> smart dude. Uh, does a ton of brain scans. He said uh, he said Freud was wrong, and it shouldn't be penis envy; it should be brain envy. He said he was wrong. So he scanned his brain. He said it was the top of his class. He's done thirty thousand scans at the time, he's scanning all these people. And he finally scans his, and he his brain was unhealthy. He was unhealthy. Top top dog in this this stuff knows more than anybody in this planet. And his sixty year old mother had a beautiful brain. His was toxic as could be. This is the moral of why I started this thing. It's the moral of my story. I said it again today. I golf with some guys from church like I said it out loud to them like you could be the best teacher the best communicator the best help or other caretaker but if you can't apply it to yourself what are we doing so this is what I've been working on my my entire life that's why I'm here because it's time to take what I've learned and and, and forward face it to me so <clears throat> Point it on yourself and see how much we can do. Because if we've done this much already, and we really haven't dove into all the all the, the stuff, you know, can you imagine what we ha we're capable of doing? Second half of the game, some Tom Brady stuff. Fourth quarter, win the whole thing. Hope everybody knows who Tom Brady is. I didn't mean to make a reference there. Um, anybody have anything they want to share? Say, y'all. Anybody? Anybody have a? How about um? What was good today? Let's just do that. Let's just do that right now before we leave. Let's do our little. Uh, this is before bed, but let's do it right now. What went well today? Anybody have something? Man, it's a tough crowd. I felt, like we were, I felt like we were learning, but I think we're going backwards. What's going on here? Well, this went well. This Everybody on a, mute? This Have was I been a, mute the whole time? This went well today. Let's talk. Um, yeah. I had a really good day. I went to, I went golf. I took uh, Pastor Chad and two other guys from church golfing today. So I had a really good day because I had a really good, I like golfing and I, it's a good moment for me, but I had good company. Um, yeah. So that went really well today. It was good to do golf without an agenda. I've been playing a lot of golf for work lately and today had zero agenda to it. So that was well. Who else? Whitney, Portia, Jason, what about all today? Don't think too hard. So I had a pretty good day. It didn't start out great, but I did some organizing and I love to organize. So I did that. I worked out. I got my nails done. I volunteered 
at the concession stand. I met up with a friend. So, and then I'm here. So I think it was turned out to be a pretty good day. Monday, Monday. My Monday. I like oh, it. Yeah. Productive Monday. I like that. Okay, two left. I get the. We're not going to bed. I have unlimited Zoom now, so I can stay on all the time. It doesn't cut off anymore, so we can stay here all night. Um, I had a good day. Um, good connection. Um, I had a good Zoom call. Went well. And I also did some organizing and got rid of some, a lot of papers I didn't need anymore. So that was good. Always feels good to, I think, um, clear the energy, make room for new space. And um yeah, other than that, it was good, uneventful. Um, I did have, I think, some low moments, but the high moments overcame the low moments. Love that. That's the idea. I love that. Jason? Oh, I had a, everything went good today. Everybody was safe and got home. The boys were all in a good mood. And so just a good day all the way around for a Monday. For a Monday. You know, I had this conversation at church last night. I told a guy, he goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I go, I don't know, but I love Mondays. And he's like, why? I'm like, because I tend to like things other people dread. It gives me a leg up on the rest of the world. I mean, there's millions of memes on how Monday sucks and I dread Monday. And you get to Tuesday, you just started the weekend. It's already coming up. I can't wait till it's Friday. You don't do anything anyway in the weekend. You hate Monday again. I say, I love Monday. Yeah. No, I love that, Monday. That was this morning, I was I mean, getting fresh. my soda. I was getting my soda this morning at the gas station, and the lady there got. And she goes, "How's your morning going?" I said, "Pretty good for a Monday." She goes, "Well, don't you like your job?" I said, "Yeah, I really, really like it." I said, "I've been there twenty eight years. I really like it." She goes, "Well, there you go." <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> that right there, my friend. That's something that went well. This human interaction is is massive, man. I've been. I've been blessed, I think, to be in a new city because I've had a lot of it lately, and I've been trying to lean into it and embrace it and challenge myself to talk to people I, that normally wouldn't. And I'm not saying any class or anything. I'm just sometimes I go in and get a coffee, and I'm out, and I'm just I'm trying to be more intentional and, and, and aware in my space. So yeah, that's a good moment, dude. That always goes well. I love that. Great. It made my day a little better. The way, you know, you always think Monday, oh my gosh, five, four, or five more days or whatever. But the minute she said that, she goes, don't you like your job? I said, yeah, I really like it. She was a little think of a positive. I said, well, I am, but now you just made me think a lot more positive. So there you go. Uh, Whitney, how do you feel about Mondays? How do I feel about Mondays? Yeah, as a, as a day, do you love them? Do you dread them? What do you feel about Mondays? Uh, it's just, it's another day. I don't think of it any differently. It's the start of a new week. I don't dread it. I don't love it. I. You don't love it? Isn't it your day? It's your full day off to yourself. You don't love it? No, I do. Well, yes and no. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> some days I don't have anything to do and that is not good for me. So. Got it. But. So I'd rather be busy doing stuff. Well, you can always call me and organize my stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> I will come and organize for anyone. Oh, who would like shit. Stuff Perfect. organized. Sad I'll bring my label maker and everything. Like you don't, have, <laughs> you don't ever feel like you don't have nothing to do. You yeah. Just, <laughs> give, yeah. Me to do. give you about eight things to do. Yeah. Perfect. That's the classic, right? Pretend like, pretend like you're busy or somebody's going to give you something to do. Something to do. Well, that's how you get stuff done is you ask a busy person to do something for you and you'll, it will get done. Yeah, that's right. That's what they say. I love that. All right, gang. I appreciate you. We'll, um, we'll reconnect Monday. Um, yeah. I'm going to go try a, uh, a bike connect. I bought a new bike, so I'm gonna go try a bike connect, see how that goes. Cool. We're gonna bike around my way. I love it. Yeah. Electric bike, I hope. Oh, I got a fast one, so I'm gonna dust these fools if they got regular bikes. I'm out. <laughs> you get the coffee shop. <laughs> Make sure you bring a bring a Batman mask. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right in. All right. Um. Yeah. God bless everybody. Hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, Monday, I'll see you Monday. Connect week. Zoe. Love you guys. Love you guys. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye.